everyone. Welcome to this broadcast. I want to share with you some of my thoughts with the markets because, of course, people are particularly concerned with the market gyration. So you're going to need two things. You're going to need a pen and paper. And I know that sounds boring. You might want to get a phone uh, to take a screenshot of some of the things that you can see on my screen okay uh of course the markets have been a little bit crazy when you see these kind of returns that you can see on the screen now uh you would expect the markets to be a bit volatile and tumultuous uh, i mean you know getting thousand pound thousand percent returns in five days or 500 percent, and so on and then of course there's this massive fear of missing out so there's a whole bunch of people getting into these companies as well and not all of those companies are high quality uh, as you can imagine then you've got the crazy world of crypto so what what's actually going on and i'm not going to talk much about crypto i'll give you uh, some of these crazy returns uh, i'm not actually going to address anything about crypto if you want crypto and you fear you're going to miss out then you know go ahead buy some make sure it's risk capital and in 10 years either you'll be a gazillionaire or you'll have nothing to show for it that's probably the best strategy i can think of those of you who believe you'll be gazillionaires god bless you those who think you'll have nothing to uh show for it you probably don't want to be in there so enough of crypto but what about the broader market and what's going on and we've got two things really you've got on the one side the market hitting all-time highs and of course your pensions tied to this uh, let alone your children's inheritance, most probably. And then on the other side, well, we got the warning uh, just a few days ago. Goldman Sachs chief economist warns of a pullback. Could be coming soon. Uh, clearly, he sent the memo to their traders as well. And uh, that's led to a bit of panic. So should we be panicking? How much should we be worried? What do we do to make sure we've got some degree of resilience as well in light of what's going on with the markets well one indicator of course suggests that we've got a problem and that it's a crash it's not even going to be a dip and there's a crash and it's going to be pretty bad and this is the so-called warren buffett value versus historical trend uh, uh and this has been going on uh for a while at extreme levels extremely high levels okay so that being the case what do we do about that worry? Well, we don't ever go just straight into cash. And whilst you look at this or take an image of this, uh, I'm going to show something else. Well, we don't obviously go straight into cash. What we do and what most people uh, do, who are sensible, of course, with these things, is they say, well, hey, wait a minute, I better have some pretty resilient companies instead. I better not just go into cash. I better just have some degree of resilience. What does that mean? What will protect my portfolio so I don't have a problem uh, uh, in the markets going forward? What are those kinds of things which are going to do that? So let's just have a look at that. And of course, you've got on top of all that, you've got headlines like this, uh, Beach Bum who beat Wall Street and made millions on GameStop. And you've got the Reddit day traders uh, who are making millions. Now, you can imagine there's a lot of money going to the markets and hence some of the volatility. So how do we make sure we don't get our boat doesn't get capsized by the by the either the panic of the amateurs or the flood of money, which is acting like a tsunami? How do we make sure we're getting a good night's sleep and we're getting returns through all this noise? And that's what I want to share with you. And to give you some perspective, this is just the last five days. OK, it is the Dow. Uh, the U.S. markets, of course, the Dow, the Dow is only 30 stocks, by the way. S&P 500, the clue as to how many stocks that is, is, is in there. Uh, that's the NASDAQ 100, you can see there. The U.K. market, the Russell 2000. Now, for me, tactically, I am more than happy to hold a few of the Russell 2000, which are the smaller companies. Just think of it, anything not in the S&P 500. And a few of the U.K. companies. I recently bought CMC Markets, for instance. However... That is not just based on that. You can't pick a stock based on a few charts. It's got to be more analysis. And I'm going to show you what that analysis involves and why I've come to that conclusion and what it should be and why it works anyway, okay, in all of this. Uh, so uh, uh, let, let's go on to the next one. This is, again, the last – sorry, this is not the last – this bit's not the last five days. It's, as you can see down here, the last three months. 
And in the last three months, we've not done too bad. So whilst we might have panicked that, wait a minute, we've dropped 6% in just five days in the NASDAQ, for instance. And of course, there was a lot of profit taking. I mean, there's all this talk about bond yields, uh, yawn, yawn. It's not. If people taking profit, for God's sake, if it was bond yields, you'd see a, a collapse right across the board, uh, not just in the NASDAQ, okay? It'd be, it'd be equal across all equities, not just a narrow technic technology index uh, like the NASDAQ. Uh, so what do we get? Instead, we get over the last three months, sorry for the heading being wrong, for the last three months, actually, we're doing all right. Uh, the Russell 2000, again, smaller cap companies, which are catching up to their bigger peers, and I think that'll continue as a theme this year, are up 19%, not bad, 20 odd percent in three months, is it? Uh, and again, like I said, the UK, uh, unusually for the UK over a three month period, outperforming the American markets, which is why Tactica, I'm willing to have in my portfolio a few UK companies as well as uh, US ones. So how do we put some of this again into some degree of context? Let me give you PayPal as an example. This is not stock advice, okay? It is to give you an example. What you see on the left-hand side is a projection of returns based on if, History repeated itself. History never repeats itself. It rhymes, as you've heard, but it never repeats itself. But let's just look at what would happen if history were to repeat itself and do as well as the 90th percentile, the top 10% of times that PayPal has done well. Well, I would double my money in a year. Okay, that's what would happen. Now, if instead we have a more a greater decline in the market. So we've got nothing to do with PayPal for a second, just a bigger problem with the market. It's over, it's frothy, it's overvalued. Guess what happens? I have to wait three years to double my money. Got it? Now, there is no amount of sort of stock picking or, or, or sort of uh, telepathy, which is going to make, make me move the markets. I am able to control only one thing, the stocks I pick. I cannot control the other rest of the environment. So which of these two will it happen? Well, I don't think it'll be in the 10th uh, percentile, the worst. I don't think it'll be in the best. It'll probably be somewhere in between. And so I've got to ask myself, if it, which stocks will, if they're not in the best and not in the worst, I'm still willing to accept. And most importantly, if they're in the worst 10% of the, what they've ever done, what am I willing to accept? It's a bit like house prices. The old saying used to be, in the 1970s and 80s. If there's a recession, it'll take five years for your house to double. If there isn't, it'll take three years. Well, with stocks, and if you get the right value growth income stocks, and I'm going to talk about that in how we pick these, then if you get the good ones, it'll take a year or two maybe to double. If not, it might take three or more to double. But that's all fine in theory. How does that actually work out? And how do we find what those stocks might be in any event? And one thing that I want to show you is I want to show you what might be the safest stock I can think of. Not necessarily one you want to buy. I'm just giving an example of a safe stock. What we see here, this is Microsoft, by the way. Okay, so ample risk warnings. It's not stock advice and it doesn't. Uh, and, and when I say safe stock, don't forget it fell 15% last year uh, uh, between February and March. In one month, it fell 15% with the COVID warnings alongside all other stocks. So much for diversification. Okay, and this idea that, oh, spread your risk among stock, they all fall in tandem and they're highly correlated on the downside when the markets fall. So don't think, oh, I spread it wide uh, uh, helps you so much or by sector or by country, and I'll show you the data on that as well in a second. What you do need to know when you look at this is this. In 20 days, a typical stock like this might be down 29%. That would give anybody uh, indigestion, all right? But over 250 days, oh, look, the distribution of returns over a rolling 250-day period for a stock like this is between up 15% to 70%. This is not to say go out and buy it. What I'm trying to say is this is why when you've got a company which has a distribution like this, which tend to be companies which are value, growth, income, very, in other words, relatively undervalued, strong growth, good income, uh, high Sortino, in other words, good average return and consistency of return, uh, high alpha outperforming the market and good cash flow, and I'll come to all of these terms in a second, then what you have is you have the ability to stay calm in the short-term declines that you might see because you know over the longer term it is the kind of company which will revert back to fundamentals. So short-term noise doesn't worry you for longer term. People like me, 
and, and risk warnings again, uh, I tend to leverage these kinds of companies two to one, only two to one. Why? Well, because after 20 days, I don't want to be down double that. I don't want to be down 60%, do I? No, right? So I only leverage two to one. Uh, uh, and why would you pick companies like this? I told you, good night's sleep, uh, expected higher returns over the longer term of 12 months. And why 12 months? Again, I'll show you the data and research on that. So this is to show you short-term panic in quality companies it rarely is a 12-month problem, okay? And again, and this, by the way, is an example with something a bit more volatile, PayPal, I've given as an example. I'm only giving it as an example. It's not a stock pick. It's not to say go out and just buy uh, PayPal. I do, full disclosure, I do happen to own Microsoft and PayPal, and I'll explain what else I own in a second. 20 days, you might be down 29%, but you're expected to have a positive return over a 12-month period. Again, that gives me the reassurance when I see short-term noise, and you can sort of see, whoops, there, Bloomberg over my shoulder. That's not something I need to necessarily worry about. By the way, I thought I'd share this. Some of the most shorted stocks in the US markets. Now, don't go out and trade these. This is the Wild West. These are the ones which the retail crowd think they're going to make go to the moon. And these are the ones which, obviously, if they're well shorted in a market decline, are more likely to fall as well. So it's not something I gamble on. But people ask me, they say, well, what happened with all this GameStop and AMC? And what's next? What might be on the hit list? I don't gamble on any of that. If you want to play Russian roulette with your money, uh, and roulette would be the right word because you would be gambling, then those are some of the most shorted stocks. Where are we with the Dow? Well, funnily enough, that's the Dow since, which is the Dow 30, 30 largest US companies, which tends to be a barometer for the stock market in the US and worldwide. That's it since, well, the last six odd years. And what have you got there? Well, we're not actually, and the red line is where I think we'll probably end up reaching uh, uh, and uh, over the next maybe few weeks, that worst case, and I think there's a 40% chance that worst case gets hit. Guess where we are, despite the gyrations of the last couple of days? We're nowhere near it yet. So there's a lot potentially on the downside, and hopefully things will just keep going up and up and up, but I don't deal in hope. I deal in probabilities, and that's why I need the kinds of stocks which if the market throws a fall and a decline, they're the resilient companies because value, growth, income, and so on as well. Uh, James, I said, I thought art funds were the most shorted. Now, you might be right, but that wasn't funds. These are stocks. Um, they're not funds. Where it says stocks on the Russell 3000, it's important uh, piece of information there. Uh, a stock is not a fund, and Russell 3000 doesn't have funds on it. Uh, now, markets don't only go up. So that's why I look to buy the best. So for those thinking, I'll just track an index. I'll just follow the index. Well, that's the Dow from the year 2000 to the year 2012. 2000, thank you, James. Thank you, my friend. Um, 2000 to the year 2012. Went nowhere, effectively. Of course, it had some periods it went up, some periods it went down. So all those people saying, oh, well, what people should do is just buy indices, just buy the index, buy the index. Don't try and outsmart it. Well, there's a problem with that. You'd have 12 years of well, getting back to where you were. And in between there, you had uh, a couple of times when uh, you, you know you, you really got scared. And of course, you rebounded. And obviously, everybody focuses on, oh, look at these massive gains we had since 2009. Well, it only brought you after three years to where you were in 2008 anyway. So I'm not really going to be a big fan of index tracking, OK? I think it's a bit of a cop-out. I think it's better than nothing, better than a bank account. Uh, in my view, over the longer term, uh, and certainly better than fund managers. So if you ask me where, where what, what's better, well, I'd probably say index trackers are better than fund managers and a bank account, but I'd rather you learned a bit more to pick individual stocks. So what are these individual stocks? Well, again, I'm not going to go with the fund managers, I'm afraid. This is an article from the UK paper, The Telegraph, on the 20th of February, so six days ago, just six days ago. Investors urged to move £50 billion pounds held in underperforming dog funds. The amount of money in so-called dog funds has risen by a third in the past year. If you've checked your pension uh, and found out where it's being invested, and most people don't realize this, they go, oh, my employer pays into my pension. I get tax back from it. I, I get this perk that my employer pays in it. Everything's fine. Yeah, but it's not the tooth fairy who generates money inside that pension. It then goes to a fund manager to pay himself a fat salary, and it's usually a him, and how does it perform? Well, data suggests not very well. 
So how are we going to avoid that problem? At least educate yourself to ask the right questions to where they're putting my money, which fund, which fat fund manager they're giving it to. So let's just look at some of the education so you can learn what questions to ask. There's another problem. Value investing. You might go, oh, I'm going to go to value investing. I want to go to growth investing. I'm going to get momentum. I've heard all these things. They've got an underperformance. So we're not going to go for style. We're not going to say, oh, I'm going to gamble on value style or momentum or income because you're still gambling. It's like gambling on news. Oh, what's going to be the next big theme? We need we need companies which, of course, rise when everything goes up and we all look like geniuses anyway, but we need the kind of companies which, when the market falls, don't fall as far. Okay, resilient companies. Uh, so that, it's not about the money we made when the markets went up, it's the money we kept when the markets fell. So how are we going to do that? That's what I'm building up to. And by the way, the reason I keep mentioning 12 months and not even two, three, five, or I'm going to hold this stock forever, is there's some research from Goldman Sachs. And what it shows is that overall, 12 months is roughly the period institutions hold. Uh, and also, I think the reason for that is because it's the period over which uh, companies' uh, accounts operate on the share price. Now, they don't operate over just one day. They don't operate over 50 years. Today's accounts don't operate for the next 50 years. You can't trust the company for 50 years from how it was today. Uh, uh, otherwise, investing would be very easy. Uh, so 12 months, and then I review, okay? And I'll give you some other figures and why I look at them. Equally with index tracking, and this is a real problem for people in Britain, because, of course, you've heard the U.S. markets are all-time highs, and, of course, and you might be thinking, how come we don't have that in the UK? And it's been a long-term problem. This is the FTSE 100. It's at 1999 levels. OK, actually, I think it's probably just around just above 1998 levels. I was in my 20s when the FTSE was at these levels. I wish it could take me back uh, in my age as well. Uh, fund managers track this. Now, just look at your pension and see how close to the FTSE 100 performance it tracks. And that worries me because that means you've worked and put money into your pension for the last 20 years. It's great because it's tax free. Fantastic. Employer contributions. Fantastic. Pensions are the best thing ever. They are great tax wrappers, whether it's Roth IRAs or 401ks and, and, and any tax-free stuff, I, 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 ISAs, um, ISAs rather, uh, tax-free, and SIPs, which are proper pensions, okay? All great. But it's where's the money being invested? Where's it going? Because you could end up with nothing to show for it. And that's why we need to make sure you're educated to know to ask the right questions, okay of it and in case you think oh the answer is i know i'll get a diverse mix of small and large companies well actually what this shows correlation they're highly correlated to each other do not think for a moment oh i've got some small cap companies and large cap companies i've got diversification all my eggs are not in one basket you've been misinformed you've learned biases from some poor journalistic column somewhere or oh, but no no i put it in different countries i put it some in emerging markets highly correlated the world is connected more than ever. There's the data. There's a high degree of correlation between different economies as well. So don't sweat it that you haven't invested in a Chinese company and a Vietnamese company and a company out of Laos, and most of your stocks are in UK and US equities either, okay? Uh, either. And for those thinking, oh, I think we've got a dip, okay? I think we've got a dip. For those thinking that, uh, this is something to be aware of. And this was data collated by two people who won the Nobel Prize in economics. They didn't get it just for this data. Uh, this is the S&P 500, the 500 large American companies. What you would earn over 20 years if you were invested in all trading days. Well, that's why I don't like indices. It'd be 6% per annum. Thanks very much. The bank accounts probably can do better than that for a large part of that 20 years. Okay, but that's what you would get. If you miss the best 20 days, in those 20 years, you were left with next to no gain at all, right? So those thinking, oh, is it time to buy the dip? The chances are you're not going to end up perfectly timing, unless you've got a crystal ball or into witchcraft. What you will end up doing instead is missing the train as it leaves the station. Now, this is not me saying, oh, give your money to fund managers. I already told you they're rubbish. Or index trackers. I'm saying you have to take responsibility, and I'll tell you what I think are the ways you should be picking. Joe, you've asked what's hot now. Joe, seriously, what stock should I get today? Uh, Joe, I can't give you individual stock advice. I don't know who you are. You might be a billionaire, and your stock will be different to if you're a widow uh, with a thousand pounds. Okay, but let me tell you how I think they should be picked, and what I own, and what I like. Okay, I can tell you that in a second. No issues. And by the way, one of the reasons uh, that I'm 
happy to look at more smaller cap companies despite the high correlation is, well, there's some data to show I might be able to eke out a few percentage points extra in my return. And by smaller cap, I mean outside the S&P 500, okay? Uh, and this is the data for that. By the way, this is the past week. I'll just show a cleaner picture. This is the past week in the S&P 500. A lot of blood on the floor, but not everything's been declining in a week. Okay, you can see there were quite a few stocks which have uh, gone the other way. You can also see, if you look at that carefully, it was mainly profit taking from the ones which had previously, <coughs> excuse me, done the best. Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet, Tesla. So again, there's a reason to suppose I'm not particularly scared or worried because it's not a wholesale crash of the market. It seems more like profit taking despite what the TV journalists are saying over my shoulder, which is, oh, bond yields. Bond yields have increased and therefore people are moving out of equities. With the moving out of equities, all of that should be read. Okay, and that's just the last week alone. So that's one reason I'm optimistic we've got not a crash, famous last words. These are analysts um, and their ratings on individual stocks. The closer to the number one, that means strong buy. Closer to the number five, that means strong sell. As you can see, analysts tend to be over bloody optimistic. And you can see the, um, the 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 table there, as it were, of what strong buy. So Microsoft is one of the most popular companies, Alphabet and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, very few turn up anything other than green on this. Okay, so obviously these guys are bidding up and telling their clients, keep putting money in the markets. That gives some degree of a flaw to the market. They're always over optimistic. Where will the flight to quality be? Well, I tend to look at valuation, because I don't, I, I, I know undervalued companies do better than overvalued ones, but valuation is not something which always works. So I also look at revenue growth, dividend yields, because again, all these factors we know are relevant to share price performance, but the impact varies. So we want to tick all those boxes, cash flow, and I'll show you why that's incredibly important, but it's not the only thing. Okay, it has to be all of those, Sortino and Alpha, Sortino being consistency of performance and Alpha being outperformance of market. Obvious two things you need to know, okay? Um, in our, in our hedge fund, when we have sovereign wealth funds or we have institutions looking to invest, they will always ask Sortinos and Alphas. They don't ask, they're not, they're less bothered on performance because that comes into Sortino and Alpha. Anyway, and this is the rest of the world, by the way, rest of the world and what the analysts think, and they're pretty bullish on the rest of the world. These are all global companies which are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. It's not an advert for the New York Stock Exchange. So Alibaba happens to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, okay? Taiwan Semiconductor happens to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, um, Unilever, et cetera, Rio Tinto, et cetera, et cetera. They're what's called American Depository Receipts, making it a bit easier to buy these. My point being, pretty much a lot of strong buys and buys out there. So the message is going out worldwide, not just the US economy, keep buying, keep buying. That should give some kind of flaw to the market as well. This is the poverty gap. This is the poverty gap between being a UK pensioner or saver who puts their money in their SIP and ISA and being non-UK. Because the UK ones tend to invest in their domestic markets and give their pension funds to fund managers who also invest in the domestic markets with about 10% in global stocks, okay? Well, I'm afraid the difference is this. Over the last five years, the American who might have gone or the global investor who might have gone more NASDAQ or more S&P, and this is five years. And it's not a week. It's not just, oh, it's an aberration of a day, okay? And you can see how they actually all move lockstep. It's just that one grows more than the other. They, they, they mirror each other pretty much, except those little differences, those little one step taken here uh, a bit faster there. They're all running on the same track. Um, uh, leads to 128% for the American in their pension. And that's just if you're tracking an index. And you should be doing better than an index because an index includes not just good stocks, but a load of bad ones as well. Okay, that's 128%. And the poor Brit in their pension has got nothing. So if you look at your pension tonight and you think, how come when the markets are all-time highs, I've still got what I had five years ago? How come I'm paying that IFA to pick a portfolio for me? And he's just generating nothing, but his bloody checks come on time. He's, he's checks as in his invoices, asking for my money come on time. Uh, and in fact, his fees are taking more out of my portfolio than the returns I'm getting from anything he's picking. Well, those are all things to worry about, I'm afraid. And there's a poverty gap. I want to, through education, 
try and get people to understand and make sure they ask the right questions of their advisor when they're picking stocks as well. Okay, and this is a typical bad portfolio of a UK investor. It was somebody who came to me and they said, look, this is what I own. And I went, oh my God, we're not talking names you and I have not heard of. Look, they're down, look at that. They're down 40% in three months, uh, uh, just there. Okay, why? Well, they picked Aviva, BAE Systems. It's not like co companies we've not heard of, Banco Santander, BP, BT, Centrica, uh, uh, they picked Lloyd's Banking Group, National Grid, Shell. It's not like I'm going to say, oh, well, obviously, Lloyd's, what, what were you thinking? Or BP, what were you thinking? They picked a, a diverse range, well diversified, good luck to you, okay, of companies which have got strong name recognition. Everybody knows them, and that's the base on which they picked them. And they were down 40% whilst... The US market has just hit an all time high. What the hell's going on? And these are stocks which are the most popular amongst UK fund managers as well. Now, I'm British. I want British people to get rich. I want them to get rich by owning global stocks. By the way, you know, global stocks can go in your SIP and ISA, don't you? So if you buy a Microsoft, it can go in your SIP and ISA. Okay. I want them to buy those global stocks and have Americans working for them and making them rich, right? But in order to be able to do that, but in order to, to be able to do that, they need to know what the hell they're doing. And name recognition doesn't work, okay? Doesn't work. Clearly, fund managers don't work. They're letting you down. Indices are letting you down. It's going to be your own responsibility. Benjamin, I'll answer your question in just a second, in just a second, okay? So where does that leave us? By the way, all of this stuff that I'm telling you has been published. It's going to be published in my forthcoming FT book, you can't buy it, so it's not a pitch for my book. And it's been published in all my books previously in my Financial Times columns as well. And as an asset manager, it's what I use in any event. We're not open to retail, so don't worry. This is not a pitch to anybody, uh, open only to institutions. So unless you happen to be a sovereign wealth fund watching this, in which case, please do get in touch. Uh, uh, all this has been published. Let's just talk a second about some of the other big names you might hear about. So Goldman Sachs do a list of 50 very important positions of hedge funds. Why? Well, they look at 822 hedge funds and they pick 1. trillion, $1.8 trillion of growth equity exposure and they look for commonality. Now, this is not advice for you to get it, by the way. And just because they do it, I couldn't care less. I think I'm smarter than all the people who work at Goldman Sachs, by the way. Um, so that's not my point. My point is, if I see any names here, I also check, have they met my value, relatively undervalued, high growth year on year, dividend yield, cash flow, Sortino and Alpha requirements, and I'll come to those in a second. Now, I do happen to own out of this list, ServiceNow, PayPal, MasterCard, Alphabet, United Health Group, and Visa uh, uh, throughout this. The reasons I don't own some of the others is not because, oh, I don't necessarily like them, they might not have met my criteria. I don't care if 822 hedge funds representing $1.8 trillion and Goldman Sachs are on one side of the table and I'm on the other. Uh, I'm happy to go to head to head with them, but I own some of these. Now, that, But it still has to be your reason why, not because somebody said it or a, or a journalist comment, and journalist comments are getting more and more breathless. The reason is SEO, search engine optimization. They have to write about the latest thing and they have to write in terms which will get you to click on them because SEO depends partly on clicks, okay? So it has to be 10 stocks you must own now, right? Just don't fall for that, journalists. The secret to success in investing becomes companies which fall the least in down markets and are bound the most in rising markets. Everyone's a genius in rising markets. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Companies which fit the above a few, about 10% meet the value growth, these issues, profit growth, dividends, cash flow, consistent sales growth, fair valuation, outperformance. Now you might say, but Alpish, there are some um, overvalued companies which do well. There are some loss-making companies that do well. Yes, there's there's outliers to everything. There are exceptions to uh, performance, but that would be more like me putting it on red. That's like saying, Alpesh, you say that you shouldn't go to the casino to try and make money, but that guy just made some money by putting it on red. That just is does not make sense, okay? So just because some loss-making companies have done well doesn't mean that profitability is irrelevant to share price performance. We know the research shows it is a better predictor than making losses, okay? And similarly with cash flow, positive cash flow is a better predictor than negative cash flow of returns. And if you don't understand why, go work in a business for a while and you'll soon find out. And by the way, uh, this overlaps, thankfully. Some of it overlaps with what people like Goldman's, and I don't want to just pick on them, uh, do. And some of it I've stolen from them because 
I stand on the shoulders of others. Okay, so for instance, cash flow, the figure I use is croaky, uh, the return on capital invested to get my, and by the way, this is not new, something I'm saying. This was my column in the Financial Times in 2004, right? Forget such magazine headlines as 10 stocks you must buy now. Market stock success has next to nothing to do with the stocks you pick because they're all relatively highly correlated. It's to do with the underlying aspects of those stocks. And one reason I do this free education is this. When I see headlines like this, UBS rich clients get Goldman PIMCO strategies with no extra fees. I don't think it's fair the rich can spread their strategies amongst each other and everybody else is locked out. So um, uh, rather like Robin Hood, not the broker, uh, I want to share that knowledge of what I see with other people who are not as rich as Goldman Sachs and UBS and PIMCO clients. And this kind of stuff really annoys me, really angers me when I see uh, 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 articles like that. How many stocks do I hold? Well, I said 12 months for a start. For me, I tend to hold between 15 to you know 20 potentially, but largely 15. Why? Well, because guess what? Portfolio risk actually drops off a cliff after you get past that. Now, this blows people's minds. They they rapidly react to this. They go, no, my fund manager holds 100. 100 must be the right number. And I say, just do the maths on that and think about it for a second, okay? Uh, or they say to me, no, 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 that's not diversified enough. What if they're all in the same sector? Well, first of all, you wouldn't probably put them in the, all the, in the same sector. And given that you're dealing with your portfolio, not a portfolio of a billion dollar fund manager, you have probably less to worry about than being all in the same sector in any event, because you've got more fluidity anyway of movement of what you put it in. But sectors are more correlated than you think, as I showed you earlier, okay? Believe it or not, when the markets fall, Microsoft and Costco, both fall. Costco sells fruit and veg. Microsoft sells software. They both fall. They're more correlated to the downside than you would think, which is why this notion that I must have thousands of stocks to diversify. No, you're not diversifying your portfolio. You're diversifying your ignorance. Uh, and you're making an inefficient portfolio. You're nowhere near what's called the efficient frontier for the risk you're taking. So anyway, 15 to 20 is a good rule of thumb. If you want to do a PhD on it and you've realized that actually it should be some different number, go ahead. But the rest of us are making money whilst you work out the minutiae. Okay, like I said before, well, I won't go into that one. Don't need to. And another problem with fund managers, uh, you're paying 10% to be kicked in the teeth. And this comes as a shock to people. This is from a typical fund manager. Investment, £10,000. This is their screenshot. So whatever you've put your money in, whichever fund, ask for the fund documents and look all the way down to fees and it'll be page number 67 usually. I find it's page number 67 and see what the total costs are. And you'll go, no, nah, I thought they just charge half a percent a year. Yeah, that's just one of the charges. Have a look at the entry and exit fees. Have a look at all the cost of ownership. And I was shocked as well. If you cash in after five years, recommended holding period. Of course it is, because their children have got private school fees to pay, those fund managers' kids. Okay, of course they want you to lock in for five years, because they know of any rolling five years. First of all, <laughs> you'll have been in for five years, so you can't whinge too much. And also, over any rolling five years, you're probably going to get a 0% return and you'll go, oh, well, never mind. The markets were pretty rough, weren't they? Yeah, you'll convince yourself you weren't a fool because that's what humans do. Uh, and they'll have charged you a thousand pounds, a thousand pounds, 10,000 pounds. They'll have charged you a thousand. That's 10% in five years. That's a long only fund manager. That's not half a percent, is it? Go look at your documentation. Have a look now and see what they're doing. And yet another problem, I'm afraid, with these long only fund managers. This is data. Again, it was provided by two Nobel Prize winning economists. And, and they won it not just for this, but um, let me zoom in so you can see it. What it says is across every type of fund, those that did well in the first three years and outperform the market, okay, uh, outperform the market. In the next three years, none of them continue to do so, all right? None of them continue to do so, whether it's small caps, large caps, uh, value, or et cetera, okay? Real estate, international funds, small cap emerging markets. Somebody's asked, uh, James, James has asked, how do I hedge my stocks? You know hedge means to get the reverse, the perfect hedge means I bought this and I sold this and I got nowhere better off. It's the risk you take that it's going to go lower. Uh, uh, you might say, well, doesn't gold hedge? Doesn't an un uncorrelated asset? Yeah, you'd have a different asset class from equities completely, which is uncorrelated. For some people that used to be gold, 5% uh, of your portfolio only say the gold council, it used to be, well, I don't know, some people might want Bitcoin. Do you really want that hedge? 
Uh, uh, probably not. You could hedge it by shorting the index. Do you really want to do that? Do you want to say to yourself, okay, because if it goes up, the index you'll have lost on and your perfect hedge will leave you nowhere. Hedging is usually done by financial institutions. Or let's say it's done by BP because they want uh, to know the price of oil uh, is fixed for them into the future. Okay, they don't want it to move. You want things to move, and you want them to move up. But the risk you're taking is they might move down. So in that, to that extent, you don't hedge. That that you might tactically remove some capital if you think the markets are going to be a bit frothy, and say I'm going to put less in equities, more in my bank account. Uh, but that's what will generally happen. You will be exposed to some risk. And Microsoft's a good example to look at. Probably the safest company I can think of. Uh, this is when I was a retail client before I set up my uh, asset management business. That's when I was a RETA client, 2004, beating that guy who's back apparently. And the world gives him billions. Why did it give him billions? Well, because asset management is about marketing, right? Whether you are, uh, uh, name me a fund, M&G or anybody else, Aviva, it is a marketing business. It is not an investment business. It is a marketing business. Well, how do I know this? Because uh, investment managers are paid on a percentage of assets under management. So they have to maximize the assets under management. How are you going to maximize assets under management? You advertise like crazy or you have name recognition. It doesn't matter if you're rubbish. Name recognition is important. How do I know that? It doesn't matter if you're rubbish, but name recognition is important. Because when I showed you that portfolio of all those companies doing poorly, they were still in people's portfolios. Name recognition is better is better at getting attracting people, sadly, than performance and quality, sadly, okay? So people like him will always be around, I'm afraid. And, and again, if you think I'm, I'm just coming along late, um, belated to this, that's 1999 when I showed you the FTSE is still today at the levels it was then and you saw how the US markets had exploded. Well, for me, the reason I'd made that shift in 1999 and published it in the newspaper in my very first column in the FT is not because I had some crystal ball, it's because I wanted a bigger number of stocks to choose from. I've been playing the same tune for 21 odd years, okay, until I get Neil Woodford's name recognition, I won't get his billions to blow people up with either, I guess. Um, yes, we will look at hedge fund ownership. Just because we look at the hedge fund ownership reports like this, which show what hedge funds have bought and what they've sold, does not mean we blindly go into it. And by the way, on my value growth income uh, list, yes, eBay makes that list at the moment. Etsy makes that list. I mean, so, oh, Etsy, oh, obviously, because people are buying from home. I don't care what the news is. I look at the data first. And then my look at the news out of interest, but news is always a story which could sell me anything. Data, data, data. Okay, that's what the strategy is based on, data, not upon news headlines. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's exactly what the government's doing with COVID. We're going to look at the data to formulate a strategy, not newspaper headlines. It should be the same in all forms of running anything. T. Rowe Price, I own uh, as well in that list. I have nothing in the securities drop from the hedge fund list, by the way. I don't care what Warren Buffett owns. Yes, it's interesting, and my team can tell me he's just bought this or bought that, unless it's value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, Alpha. Okay, you might want to look at that. Uh, this is the sum total of what the big gurus have bought into. So Carl Icahn, Bill Gates, those with big sums of money. And darker the letter, the more they bought into it. It's not a stop it. And I bought United Healthcare. It's a safe play. So many of have got there, and it went up about 14, 15%. Amazon, et cetera, booking, Viacom. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it's, don't take a picture. You still need to do your research on value, growth, income, momentum, uh, Sortino, and alpha. And I'll come to that in a second. And yes, I may well look at what, like I said, the analysts are doing. Analysts always tend to be over optimistic, as I've said already. And just because I can get the sum total of the details of what all of these funds in all these hedge funds are buying and selling does not mean I just blindly follow it. It's got to be value, growth, income. It's probably getting boring by now. Value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, Alpha, Momentum. Okay. So, yes, you'll see a load of names thrown at you right, left, and center from the medium, uh, from the media, from everywhere else. It doesn't matter. Value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, alpha, momentum. Okay, and I showed you that a bit earlier on. You might want to take a picture. That's the that's the Goldman Sachs list I said. Just so what? So what? I know what to do now whenever I hear noise and somebody says, hey, what do you think of PayPal or ServiceNow? Both of which I own, MasterCard, Alphabet, United Health Group, Visa. Oh, isn't it nice? These fund, hedge funds also own what I bought. How come they did it? Well, some of them might actually have got the memo and know how to pick stocks. I, with hedge fund managers, I suspect they do. This was Goldman Sachs's... Um, uh, and sorry, I keep mentioning that. I don't mean to 
uh, promote them or anything. 12 stocks. Uh, these ones uh, fit into their VIP list of what he most hedge funds are buying and also what the retail clients like, given that retail clients are really up against hedge funds. The, the retail constituents, the retail favorites, by the way, here's a good one. Uh, their average year-to-date return is up 28%. The average year-to-date return for the hedge funds is up 20%. The the crossover between the two is only up eight percent year to date. Interestingly, um, so they go, and the ones which the retail owns, which the hedge funds don't, even better, is up thirty three percent, which suggests that there's a whole lot of retail clients like me in two thousand and four who might want to become hedge fund managers, as I did. Okay, and there's proof why. You might want to trust yourselves a bit more. You might want to trust yourselves a bit more. So the forty seven constituents. Which, hedge, which retail clients own, but hedge funds don't generate a 33% return. Now, within that list, there'll be some very worrying ones, okay? Uh, there might be the odd GameStop or whatever. But anyway, I'm just giving this, just throwing it out there. Uh, personally, I still want to look at value, growth, income, momentum, uh, cash flow, etc. So that's that. I've got a few questions. I better get going soon. I've got a workout session in the garden. Um, what questions have we got? With potential for rising interest rates in markets, do you feel that banks, insurance companies, etc., have become safer investments when growth stocks adversely over cash flow and discount? No, Benjamin. The, the first of all, I don't think interest rates are going to sharply rise, and I don't think the discount cash flow um, calculation changes that much. And cash flow is only one factor, uh, and a relatively well important but small factor in things value growth income cash flow momentum sortino alpha remember what's my favorite indicator my own valuation growth income and 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 croaky cash return on capital invested um there's a load of free resources on alpishpatel.com by the way including my telegram channel so you can see when i'm doing things and what i'm buying what i like and some of the reports i've shown you all of this is on my free telegram channel just go to alpishpatel.com and you'll be able to see it uh uh, this is the croaky one, by the way. This is the Goldman Sachs one, which is the croaky one. If you did want to have a look at that and what that looks like, uh, cash return on capital invested, what they found is the companies in the top 25% of companies generate 30% per annum. Now, imagine you two times leverage that, which I don't recommend, high risk, but that'd be 60% you're getting. Anyway, 30% CAGR. Actually, it'd be different um, because of leverage and the way CR, CAGR um works but anyway 30 percent per annum is that if you want to know what the formula looks like it's only one factor not the only one so that's what my spreadsheet looks like value growth income cash flow momentum sortino alpha less important altman um, volatility is if i want to mix some high vol with low vol and i want to do double leverage okay but that's how your spreadsheet should look it should have something for valuation something for growth something for income something for cash flow something for momentum something for consistency of return something for volatility something for outperformance of the market again why i said 15 stocks i showed that why i said 12 that's the goldman sachs research on why it should be 12 uh that's my spreadsheet like i said and um, I think I can make anybody a fund manager. No offense to the talents of my former secretary who read English. A lot of people ask me, what, what, what subject should I read at university to get into um, finance? Well, she came to work for my fund uh, and she, was, she read English. She was my secretary for three years and I taught her a bit about investing. She now manages $10 billion. Uh, no, sorry, 10 billion pounds. And that's with a B. I think I can make anybody. I'm going to take a little bit of credit for that. Well, I'm a man. I would, wouldn't I take credit for somebody else's female's work? But no, no, she's the one with the talent. Uh, but what I would say is I think I can turn anybody into a bloody good fund manager. Okay. So have a look at alpishpatel.com. Um, and you'll find the free resources there. If you want to learn more, you can download my book from there. I'm now giving away free because I've got a campaign to teach a million people how to be better investors. So you can download my uh, investing book for free from that site, from alpishpatel.com, and uh, you'll get my Telegram updates and everything else. Uh, what else? Thoughts on buying Apple and Tesla during these dips? That's a more complicated question. Tesla doesn't fit my profile, I'm afraid, because it's too volatile. It, it, it's off the volatility scale, so I know it's made some people money but I'd rather have a good night's sleep. Um, Apple does meet my um, criteria and I continue holding it. Uh, and Apple's the kind of company which if the market falls, say 20%, I'll tell you now, I would buy more Apple. Uh, and um, I have support for that from everybody from Warren Buffett to the financials of the company. So yeah, um, Tesla is not one I'd buy on dips, not because I don't believe in electric vehicles or anything like that. 
And uh, there's a whole Tesla mafia out there. It's just it, it's outside the parameters of my um, picking. Okay, what are my favorite long term? Long term is 12 months for me. And I've mentioned some of the names on here already. Guys, I better run. Follow me on arpospital.com if you want to see more uh, as well. Links in bio, follow, you know, all those, depending on which social media platform you're watching all this on. Uh, thank you all very much.